Basic Brewing Radio is sponsored in part by the American Home Brewers Association. Get ready, Saturday, August 6th is Mead Day. In celebration of this sweet homebrew holiday, the American Homebrewers Association is offering listeners $5 off membership with promo code MEADDAY22. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to download a variety of mead recipes, find a homebrew supply shop, and dust off your mead-making skills with how-to videos. That's homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to get $5 off for Mead Day when you join a Renew by August 8th, 2022. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, July 7th, 2022. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, we're taking a break from content we recorded at HomebrewCon to continue our series on recipe development. I collaborated with Matt Giovanese of BrewCabin.com and SwimUniversity.com to come up with a recipe for an American Amber Ale from scratch. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. If you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at basicbrewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And many thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basic brewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Financial supporters will get an early release this week, along with a behind the scenes video of my no boil, mostly Zamba New England IPA uh, fermented with I-22 Capri from Imperial Organic Yeast. It was a simple brew day, and I'm, I'm glad it was because I, I, I didn't boil, and it was short uh, because I just did a 30-minute hop stand, and uh, boy, was I glad because it was super hot and sticky outside that day. But it was uh, after I decided to dry hop that the issues started with the brew. I had a, I had a leaky keg seal and a, a hopelessly clogged dip tube <laughs> that forced me to transfer the beer to another keg after I dry hopped. But but all is well in the end. It's a tasty little beer. And... Um, uh, financial supporters will see that episode in the behind the scenes uh, this week by Friday, and the general public will see uh, the uh, the episode next week, but they won't see the behind the scenes stuff. Next week on this very show, I plan to run the conversation that we had with Dr. Matt Winans, head of R&D at our friends and sponsors, Imperial Organic Yeast. We talked to Dr. Matt about his tips on making sake. At home, because he gave a presentation about that at HomebrewCon. And we also talked to him extensively about this new hybrid yeast, I-22 Capri, and how that came about. It's not just mixing together samples of two different yeasts in a pouch. This is not a blend. I-22 Capri is a genetic hybrid of Imperial's Juice, which is an English strain, and Loki, which is a Gvike. And uh, usually, as you know, yeast produce... Uh, or reproduced by budding and making clones of themselves, essentially. But uh, Imperial's working on making hybrids of different yeast strains. It's a fascinating topic, and Dr. Matt will give us tons of details into the I-22 Capri process on next week's show. Very exciting. I'm happy uh, with how my Capri beer has turned out, and Steve is working on a mead with Capri, and really looking forward to tasting that when that's done. You know we love Imperial Organic Yeast with 200 billion cells in each easy-to-open pack. My stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore to make starters for moderate gravity five-gallon batches. And when I pitch by early afternoon, my airlocks are usually bubbling before bedtime. Ask your local homebrew shop about Imperial Organic Yeast and I-22 Capri and check them out at imperialyeast.com. Okay, let's get to it. I really enjoyed going through this process with Matt. It's uh, really what I was envisioning when Matt and Chris Colby and I started collaborating on these recipe development shows. We've talked process and ingredients. Now we build a beer from the ground up. Matt Giovanisi, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me once again. We've been talking in abstract about recipe development. Now we're going to actually get down where the rubber meets the road. We're actually going to try to, like, build a recipe. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm, I'm nervous, excited, and nervous and excited. <laughs> In that order. In that order. <laughs> Well, and I and I I just threw out a suggestion to you of you know mm-hmm. what if we do like you know American Amber Ale, mm-hmm. and I said you can pick whatever whatever style you want to do, uh, but you decided to stick with that. I uh, yeah because I've never I've never developed an amber recipe on my own, so I figured I liked the idea of coming in fresh with it, having to do the research, what goes into it, what are what are the commercial examples that I like, and and what do you like. And let's just build it together and see what we come up with. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think it would be fun. Uh, and it would be more fun to, you know, actually brew it after we did it. But we'll see. <laughs> I am, I'm interested. <laughs> I, you know, after doing all the research, I'm like licking my lips. I'm like, I want to make this beer. Yeah, it sounds tasty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, now I, I start uh, generally when I start thinking about doing a recipe, especially one that I haven't done before. I get out my phone and I go to the uh, BJCP app mm-hmm. and i and i look because there's it, it's it's really handy in several ways and shout out to uh, to them that uh, that that put it together uh, but if you look at, if you search for amber first of all you get a big long list of amber things uh, or mm-hmm. you know styles that where uh, the word amber is a part of um, you know all the way from uh, international amber lager uh, Czech Amber Lager, Fest Beer, Martzen, Rausch Beer even, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, Dark Mild, British Brown Ale. So, you know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of descriptors in the, uh, you know, with the, with the, or a lot of styles that use the, uh, the word amber in them. But then we come down to style 19A, which is American Amber Ale under the uh, amber and brown American uh, beers category, and its its siblings are California Common and American Brown Ale. So, mm-hmm. once we click on that, we can uh, have the description of the style in detail. It talks about aroma, low to moderate hop aroma with characteristics typical of American or New World hop varieties: citrus, floral, pine, resinous, spicy. Tropical fruit, stone fruit, berry, or melon. So that <laughs> that is a pretty wide range of, of yeah. hop character right off. Yeah, I was surprised by how it's like, okay, any hop. <laughs> Almost like any <laughs> hop will do. <laughs> well, since it's American, you know, we're pretty <laughs> yeah. we, we kind of do what we want to do. <laughs> That's true. Uh, a citrusy hop character is common but not required. Moderately low to moderately high maltiness <laughs> on the aroma, mm-hmm. usually with a moderate caramel character. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's another clue for you. Mm-hmm. Appearance amber to coppery brown in color. Moderately large off-white head with good retention. Generally quite clear, although dry hopped versions may be slightly hazy. Uh, and then flavor, moderate to high hop flavor with characteristics typical of American or hop or New World hop varieties, the same as the aroma. Um, the uh, malt and hop bitterness are usually balanced and mutually supportive, but can vary either way. And I'm just scanning through these. Yeah. Uh, fruity esters can be moderate to none. Caramel sweetness and hop flavor slash bitterness can linger somewhat into the medium to full finish. Um, medium to medium full body. Um, it, it, overall impression, an amber, hoppy, moderate strength American craft beer with caramel, that word again, malty mm-hmm. flavor. The balance can vary quite a bit with some versions being fairly malty and others being aggressively hoppy. So there's a lot, a lot big range to play with there. Yeah. And then I'm skipping down. It also talks about uh, general comments and history. Uh, but then it talks about ingredients, which Hmm. really gets my attention. They suggest pale ale malt, typically North American two-row, medium to dark crystal malts, may also contain specialty grains which add additional character and uniqueness. Now that... (laughs) Yeah, I know what they're they're saying there. (laughs) But it seems like, uh, you know, that's that's kind of a... 
you know, with all respect to the BJCP, that, that's kind of a not a lot of specifics in that. No. You know, may also contain specialty grains which add additional character and uniqueness. Yeah. <laughs> so, would they taste like toast or or old feet or you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's Smoked u- malt. Well, like, yeah. <laughs> that's unique. <laughs> Um, American or New World hops often with citrusy flavors are common, but others may also be used. And then um, they compare uh, with other styles. And then this is the other thing that is really useful for me. They have the vital statistics, which is is the original gravity should be, they suggest, from 1045 to 1060. Mm -hmm. Final gravity from 1010 to 1015. IBUs of 25 to 40. Yeah. An SRM, which is the color, of 10 to 17, and an ABV of 4.5 to 6.2. And then they have commercial examples listed as well. So just in that, you know, that's usually kind of the starting point that I go to, uh, you know, the BJCP guidelines. And Mm -hmm. and we have to say that you don't have to stick with styles. No. You can brew whatever you want. It's just that styles are generally useful, at least as a starting point. Because people have kind of refined them over time, and lots of people like them, uh, they are successful, and you know they're kind of proven. Yeah. So, so what's the first step on your path in in researching this this style? Well, you know, just reading that, um, the one thing that that stands out to me is the word amber. It's mm. the only thing that's kind of guaranteed right because the hop bill can be all over the place um but the grain bill is really going to be the important part i think of this recipe which calls for uh you know caramel caramel crystal malt or whatever um but the first you know like no I, you know that right as as somebody who drinks a lot uh it, it, you know moderately you should say uh, as a uh, for research for science often maybe often yes um i i kind of i've had my fair share of amber ales. Am I drinking them all the time? No. Uh, they've they've sort of fallen out of favor a little bit, I would say. They're not as popular when you go into a lot of uh, breweries. But I happen to live pretty close to New Belgium, which is, uh, mm. you know, kind of one of the more popular uh, amber ales, right, but with fat tire. And so the first thing I kind of look at whenever I'm doing re- research is I look at what are the commercial examples, you know, the famous, famous ones, right? And just go, you know, sometimes when you go to their websites, the, and again, we're talking about bigger, you know, macro breweries, not necessarily, you know, the the, the big beer people, although I, I guess now they kind of are. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I live near Avery and I live near um, the, uh, Fat Tire or whatever, or uh, New Belgium. And so I know that they have ingredients listed on their website on those beers. Mm. So that's, I, I start there a lot. And every time I get cans, whenever I'm, you know, drinking or whatever, sometimes the cans or the bottles will actually, they won't tell you percentages, uh, or, you know, how much, but they'll tell you what's in it. And, uh, I was lucky enough to, that was the first place I sort of looked cause I kind of always do that. And they do tell you exactly what's in, what's in a uh, fat tire, which is, um, for, for malt, it's pale malt, Crystal 80, mm. Munich, and Victory. Oh, wow. And then, yeah, and for hops, they use uh, Willamette, Goldings, and Nugget. Huh. Right. So I'm like, okay, that's that's somewhere to start. The other thing I do, I open up all the, all the books, right? Look at every single – I look at as many recipes as I can and look for similarities and look for outliers and then start to write those pieces down. And while I was researching this – one of the outliers that I kept seeing pop up frequently was chocolate malt. And I would not have, have expected that to be in this beer. Um, so that was just one. And then I, and then yes, when it came to hops, same exact, you know, description as the uh, BJCP, which is everyone's using different hops. You can see that new Belgium's using sort of, I guess, I don't know if I want to call, they're not old world, but they're like American, but, but not as, you know, more bittering than they are flavor hops, right? The sort of standbys. Um, standbys. I don't, you know, they're not using Cascade, Centennial, Simcoe, uh, you know, citrusy hops in that beer. So I'm assuming, you know, they're leaning towards more of a malt profile. And so, yeah, it was that, that was the first place I looked. I also looked 
you know, I go to my old standby with brew your own. I go to beerandbrewing.com. I go to just, just scour the internet. And then I start taking notes in again, outliers. And then what I see as a uh, common, you know, common malts, common hops, common yeasts. And what I found is that, uh, hops again, vary grain varies, but then yeast water, pretty, pretty standard stuff. Yeah, and it, uh, you would think that uh, like fat tire, for example, may have more of a kind of a Belgian characteristic than yeah the, the typical American quote unquote uh, you know amber ale. Um, so that that may be one place where you might want to to change you know have a different course from what fat tire is doing. Right, um, and and they do the 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 yeast they list is just house ale, house ale yeast. So ah. that could be you know. That could have a little bit of a Belgian-y character to it, for sure. Yeah, and, and you, uh, uh, before we got started, you held up on camera uh, Brewing Classic Styles, you know, Jim mm-hmm. Zanishev's book. We can't uh, can't get away without mentioning that as well. Right. Yeah, and that's, a, that's the thing is, like, I just go through all my books. I got, I got a little mini library of brewing books, and I go through and just um, see what recipes are out there. And again, start taking notes and seeing which, you know, which I like things I'm like, eh, I may not like. And then sometimes you have to go and research the individual ingredients because you might see something you've never heard of before. Mm. Uh, and then, I mean, I didn't have to do that for this one, but it's like, oh, okay, let me dive a little bit more into crystal malts and, and the, and the, and the gamut. Cause I don't really use them a lot in modern, in the brewing that I'm doing today. I used to use them all the time, but it's like, Hey, has things changed? What are, are there new varieties? Are there different you know, is is the British version different than the American version? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And this is an opportunity. Uh, we had a conversation with uh, uh, with Casey Latillier when we were talking about the Kernza beer. And I got, you know, I got his input on recipe development. And he's, mm-hmm. you know, comes from a standpoint of, you know, having a five barrel system. So he's a pretty small brewery. And so he likes to experiment with different base malts from just American pale two row. Uh, right. So, you know, we as home brewers, as even smaller scale, you know, we can start off with uh, a more interesting uh, base malt because mm-hmm. we don't have a giant silo <laughs> right. of two right. row yeah. <laughs> that we use yeah. uh, <laughs> to to brew with. Um, so, so where do you – I mean, you're using brewing software, and one of the things mm-hmm. that we want to do is, you know, in this conversation is walk through actually, you know, building this – a recipe with the brewing software and kind of, you know, seeing how that – how that goes as you're, as you're entering it in. So what, mm-hmm. what are your first steps, you know, using – when you pull up your software? So the first step is, one, I, I pick the, um, the actual style. Right. So it gives me that those guidelines that you read off in, from the BJCP. And so what you just read, I see the exact same thing, but I have it in this sort of uh, this, these parameters that once I start adding fermentables like grain, it'll start to and, and also hops. You'll see those numbers start to move and I might you know adjust things as we go to kind of stay in the range. Now, I've noticed with American Amber Ale It may seem like when you read that it's got a wide variety, but the actual statistics are pretty narrow. I mean, we're looking at uh, an ABV of 4.5 to 6.2, right? So um, what I start with is kind of making a smash beer in a way. I don't necessarily go with the hops, but it's like let's let's start with the base grain and decide which one we want to use. Now, one of the questions that I wanted to ask is I want to build this together with you, and just from reading that, BJCP guideline and sort of like my interpretation of of what I think an amber ale should taste like and what I like drinking versus what you your interpretation and what you like drinking. What do you think? Do you want a sessionable uh, beer or do you want something that's got a little booze in it? I for this style, I think that just right kind of down the middle at like five five percent. I agree with you. I think, uh, you know, because, you know. You could easily go six or maybe even seven percent with something like this, especially mm-hmm. if, if you put a, a bunch of hops on there. But Absolutely. you know, I'm I'm not wanting a just a darker IPA, right? Essentially, so you want something that's balanced, 
because that, that's what I want. I want I for me, an American Amber Ale is a like crazy balanced beer, like perfectly, you know, down the middle where, you know, I'm not looking for a, a red IPA and I'm not looking for um, a brown ale. So I'm not looking for something super malty. I'm not looking for something super hoppy. I just want it to kind of you know, wash over my palate. The other thing I don't want personally is sweetness. Mm. I don't know how, I mean, I like a drier sort of, uh, amber ale. Yeah. I would, I would go with that as well. Okay. Now you mentioned brown ale, you know, Chris Colby was on the show mm-hmm. s- basically slamming brown ale because <laughs> <laughs> he, because he basically thinks it's, it's too wishy-washy. You know, it's, it tries to be too much of a balance of everything. You know, it just, yeah. tries, it's too blah, you know, not using, you're not quoting him directly, but uh, sure. <laughs> probably couldn't without bleeping myself. <laughs> but <laughs> but to me, an amber ale uh, has, in my mind, more of a bite than, say, mm-hmm. a brown ale. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely has more hop character. Uh, I think it it may be a teensy bit more dry, maybe, mm-hmm. than a brown ale. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, this is just my, I think so. just in my head. I don't have, a, and that's, you know, well, that's it. You mean, you have to go by that, right? It's like, you could do all the research in the world and you can drink all the beers in the world that, you know, are, are Amber style. At the end of the day, you're making this and you're the one that's going to be drinking most of it. I would mm-hmm. assume, I would assume so, or unless you're making it for a party or, or somebody, you know, this is a beer that I would make. If I had friends coming over who weren't into IPAs and I have those friends, they, they, they want to, whenever I take them out to a bar, they're, you know, I want Amber beer. It's like, okay, you mm-hmm. want, you know, you want, and, and to me that screams not a lot of hops and a lot of more sweetness. And that's what they like. So, and, and for me, it starts with, okay, what's our base malt? What are we going to start with? Now I, when I looked up, I've seen domestic two row pale you know, pretty standard. No, I didn't really see a lot of uh, recipes use Pilsner malt, although I've heard there's some, but not as many as, as domestic two row or pale malt. Um, and then pale ale malt, right? The, the British, a right. uh, little bit darker one. Right. Um, and then Maris Otter I've seen, but not really that much. Now I'm more leaning personally to two row or the most, you know, American two row, because we're the we're, it's an American amber ale, so I would mm-hmm. like to kind of stick in that category. I, you know, if you're if you're going to ask me, mm-hmm. <laughs> I am. I, I'm thinking, you know, for the same reason that that Casey cited, I think a lot of the reason a lot of the examples have American two row is because it's it's clean, it's cheap, yep. it's it works with everything. Uh, but I would kind of like to start off with something. A little not, bit. A not, it's not American, but maybe Maris mm-hmm. Otter just to get right. – and, and and it gets you a little bit of color mm-hmm. and it gets you some of the, you know, kind of malt sweetness right. that you're going to accentuate with the, the caramel or caramel malts. Yeah. And maybe, maybe you don't have to work as hard on that end. I don't know. Right. I So I agree with you and I would go with either one of those. Uh, now, with when I do – I'm going to put in Maris Otter into the software – I always, for whatever reason, I just start with ten pounds. I don't know what that's going to do. Yeah, you know, but yeah. that's where I start. Yeah, that'll and, that'll get that gets you around a five percent beer, right? It gets me to, in, according to, well, all right. The other thing too is I have this dialed into my system, which I have set as a mash efficiency of seventy five percent. Ah, um, so that's five point one percent ABV, uh, an original gravity of uh, one point zero five one. And a final gravity of ten twelve, although we haven't put in our yeast yet. Uh, so that's a little bit high as, as, as we start adding in other things. But that's going to give us, you know, our base. Now from there, I, you know, let's talk about um, one. <laughs> there's there's this there's this one ingredient that they talk about, which you mentioned, which was very very vague, right? <laughs> the thing that I think they're talking about. And I've seen this in a lot of recipes is and and what's going to counter the, the the Maris Otter, I think, a little bit, which is I've seen people add Munich and Victory or like biscuit malt mm. and and at around 10 percent. And wow. I think and I and obviously, like you want that biscuity, roasty, toasty. And you had that conversation um, with Chris. And I, you know, is it is the biscuit the 
Is it biscuits like we're used to in America? Is it like those biscuits? <laughs> or cookies. Or cookies, yeah. <laughs> we're talking like biscuits or yeah. cookies. <laughs> is, it, is it the uh, Great British Baking version of biscuits? Or well, I don't know what the American version is. Well, Popeye's. The Iron Chef, yeah. A Popeye's biscuits, <laughs> right. So, I mean, I guess it's cookie, right? I would, I would assume so. Yeah. Uh, more of a, yeah, more of a baked uh, uh, confectionery rather than the, you know, I, I, I picture, you know, biscuits like biscuits and gravy as more savory. Kind of <laughs> yeah, right. That's how I, that's how I picture it too. <laughs> now I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Sausage. Mm. Um, and I guess we, we should say before I get too far down the road, the 10 pounds is four and a half kilograms. So. Our friends Ricky and Kelly from Gronfell and Havoc Meaderies in Vermont have new mystery mead boxes, and they're on sale with free shipping. These uh, mystery boxes are a great way to discover new meads that you might not have tried otherwise. There's the mystery bottle box of the month with three or six bottles of premium still mead. One battle, uh, a bottle of uh, braggy is guaranteed. I think that's it. Braggy or brag eye. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's delicious either way. And there's a chance that you'll get a retired mead in your shipment with the bottle mystery box. And then there's the uh, mystery craft mead box of the month that has four four packs of small batch craft mead in cans. And to make it more fun, the uh, contents of the box is determined by your choice of one of five craft meads in a little drop-down box when you order you know I'd pick Root of All Evil Maple Edition. Mmm! Again, these mystery boxes are now on sale, and there's free shipping to most states across the country. Check out the July mystery boxes with all of the honey-based deliciousness at family-owned and operated Groenfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. So now, when we look at this... Um do we want to add something like Munich or victory when we're using Maris Otter? Or do you think we've sort of accomplished what we wanted to accomplish with Maris Otter and we really don't need to kind of bump up that maltiness um, or biscuity character? Boy, that's, I mean, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, so here's what I, I mean, before you answer, I will say that I think Maris Otter, this is, and this is just like a recipe you know, we're doing this for the first time. We're going to brew this for the first time. Well, I like to keep things simple. So I would, I would, my argument would be stick with Maris Otter. Don't add any victory malt. Don't add any, any Munich and see what that gets you the first time you brew it. Yeah. And if you're like, man, I, I just kind of wish this was a little bit more malty. Well, now you have your, you know, the next variable to try when you brew it again. That's a really good point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to so you, let's stick with Maris Otter and keep it simple. And the next thing we need to talk about is crystal malts or caramel malts or caramel malts, whatever. Um, now I did some. There's a lot of research on this um, because it, it, there's a, a wide range. What I learned was you could use a mid color crystal like 40 to 60 Levabon or a darker crystal, you know, going from like 80 to 120, and you could use a combination of those two. If you, for depending on what you want out of the, the flavor. So if you're looking for something that's clean, you know, simple, uh, you can just use crystal malts that are sort of on the lower end. Hmm. But if you want something that's more complex where, you know, mid color crystal malts are going to add more that caramel flavor. Right. But darker malts are going to add more fruit like uh, plum, raisin, whatever. Right. And, and even darker caramel. Right. And so. For me, the other thing, too, to, to, to consider here is that darker malts are less sweet than the lighter malts. So you're at the end of the day, the beer is not going to be as sweet if you if you kind of use a combination or just stick with um, the higher end crystal malts. Now, the, when I generally I haven't brewed one in a while, but generally when I brewed my just like, you know, Amarillo ale or whatever, yeah. it was like 10 pounds of. Uh, 10 pounds of two row and from half a pound to a pound of, of crystal 60. Yeah. And, and that would give kind of an orangish color to the beer. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, in my mind, you want to go darker than that. But then, but then, as you said, you know, the darker that you get, the kind of more raisiny kind of sweet mm -hmm. that you would get as well. 
Like, for instance, that Crystal 80 that you uh, mentioned, Mm -hmm. to me, I mean, Steve would make his pale ales with Crystal 90. So even that, it seems like you would need something, maybe, maybe some chocolate malt. You know, maybe just a little bit of, you know, like uh, uh, of debittered, you know, uh, like black uh, prince yeah. or something like that for mm-hmm. the for the, to boost the color without boosting you know the flavor a whole bunch. Right. So that's that was the other interesting part where uh, a lot of people add a little touch of chocolate malt and it's mainly for color. And then people, I, I, you know, because to me and I think you had mentioned this with Chris is I think chocolate malt is coffee. That's the that's what I get from it. Mm-hmm. And when I think about that. In like, all right, what do I want that in a in a amber ale? I would say, yeah, kind of like a little cough, like a little tiny bit right mm-hmm. at the end. That sounds pretty good to me. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, if we're looking at fat tire, they're doing crystal 80 and they're not using chocolate malt at all, although they could be. And there's not telling you. But <laughs> um, and obviously they're using Munich and victory, which is going to give you a little bit more color, not a terrible amount, but um we could, unless you know, they're using like the twenty love of Bonn Munich you know, or the or the darker Munich, right? That's true. They could be. So if we, so here's where we start. You know, let's just stick with what we have, right? I, I put in one pound of of crystal sixty just to see what happens. Okay, right? That gets us, you know, and I and I lowered the basically I replaced it one pound of Maris Otter with the caramel, right? So now we have nine pounds of Maris Otter, one pound of caramel. So a 90 percent base malt, 10 percent crystal malt that gives us, you know, we're still in the five point one range and which is interesting because that means we're it's telling me that uh, that crystal malt is going to give us some uh, fermentability. Uh, And. What I what the the color we get is a nine when we should be really between 10 and 17 SRM. So just that is not going to bring us to the color that we want for an amber amber ale. It's going to give us an orangey color, but not an amber color. Right now, what I can actually see a color swatch on the on the screen on your. Yeah, exactly. So which which is nice. Um, you know how accurate that actually is is you know questionable, but (laughs) that's going to be my question. If we switch it to eighty Levabon crystal, right? So we just replace that. Mm-hmm. We're now we've gone up two SRM points to 10. Right. So now we're more in range, but we're still at the lower end right. of that. Right. And we've changed, I would say, not terribly. We haven't changed the car, you know, the caramel profile from the 60 to 80 is probably not that big of a difference. I would imagine, you know, because that's that's sort of right in between the mid color crystals and the darker crystals. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, the Jim Henson, not the Jim Henson movie, but. <laughs> That was, a, that was a bad reference. Um, <laughs> I wish I was so, more familiar with that movie. I would, just, I would be laying, yeah, laying the, out some the, references. Or the sequel. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we could, you know, do maybe sort of a, a split of Crystal 40 and maybe Crystal 120 and see what that gets us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So let's let's... So I'm basically going to change and we'll stick with one pound and see what just again, see what it gets us. So if we put in uh, crystal 40 at one pound, OK, that drops us down to a 7.3 SRM. We're still pretty low, but I'm going to go ahead and add uh, 120. And if you hear me typing, I have a big mechanical keyboard, um, <laughs> so you might be able to hear it through the microphone. Um, and then so what if I just did that, OK, which gives us 11 pounds now because I added, you know, replaced one and added another one, kept the Maris Otter at nine pounds. That brings us to 5.5%. And it definitely gets us in the color range. We're at 16 now. So it's actually sort of towards the, the back end, hmm. right? So what we could do is bring down, uh, you know, maybe to a half pound of 120. And now we're sort of, you know, kind of getting in at a five point four percent beer a 12 srm we're like kind of getting more towards the middle without adding any chocolate malt 
So what is that? So you've got you've got nine pounds of the base malt, and then a pound and a half of the of the caramel. Is, is that of right? the one hundred and twenty caramel? Yeah, and then one pound of forty. So, so, I mean, what does that do? To, it sounds. It, my instinct tells me that that might be a fairly chewy finishing gravity with a pound and a half of special of the of the crystal malts. Well, that gets us into uh, we don't want our crystal malt to exceed about 15 percent is what I've read. Right. Right. Because otherwise it gets, uh, you know, overly sweet. And we haven't. We're, we're slightly under 15 uh, percent. We're more at around 14 percent. You know, so if we want to dial that back a bit, um, we could do half pound of, of each. But then we're going to need something to bump up the color. Mm. Right. Mm. So we so that's I think why a lot of people decide to use chocolate malt is because. You still get that amber color, but you can dial back the like sickly sweetness that you might get if you add too much, you know, caramel malt. Right. 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 Yeah. So I think maybe we do that. And again, it's all about keeping things simple because that's we're doing this for the first time. And what we want to do is make sure that, you know, this is something that's uh, it, it's it's easy to, to pick out, you know, the flavors that we're adding. Right. So if we look at it this way, it's like, OK, Maris Otter is going to give us the malty base. The, the caramel malt is going to give us the caramel and the chocolate malt is really just going to give us the color and maybe a hint of coffee, you know, and a little bit of dryness too, a little drier finish at the end. So I think if you if we stick to those three things, we've kept it simple. We've kept it in the realm of amber ale. We've replaced our, you know, what would normally be Munich or Victory with Maris Otter. And so now, once we've developed that and we've tried it, we've brewed it and we've tasted it, then we can say, you know what, let's go back. Let, I, want it, I want this to be sweeter or I want this to be maltier or I want this to have more cookie or I want this to be more coffeeier. So you could start to make adjustment, adjustments from there. Yeah. And so if we go back to the caramel malt and maybe we do um, – I like the idea of going to 60 because 60 is sort of directly in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then you can start to dial that back one way or the other. Right. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. And then I'm going to add chocolate. Now we're going to do pale chocolate. So we want, and this is what I've noticed is you want that chocolate to be around 200 Levabon. So more on the, you know, the lighter side and not, you know, super chocolatey. Um, so there's, uh, like Dingaman's chocolate is 250. There's crisp that makes a low color chocolate. And this is all sort of um, this is all of these ingredients that I'm looking at. What's brown? Are, what's brown malt? What's the SRM of or love a bond of, of brown malt? 50. Oh, really? Is that? Lower? Yeah. So it's lower. Yeah. OK. Um, so Choco Lat, Choco Late. Um, <laughs> I have to spell things out in my head as I type them. Um, we'll add. We'll add, I'm just going to add a half a pound and see what that gets us. So that's about 4.8%, and that's a little bit high. Um, so we can bring that down to maybe, I don't know, instead of eight ounces, which is half of a pound, maybe we do just five ounces. And this is where I start to just pull things back a little bit. So that gives us a 3% chocolate malt, um, which puts us at around... Uh, 15 SRM, which is definitely between 10 and 17. And that's pretty good. You could probably go down to four ounces. Um, so you, again, you're just giving like a hint of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sticks us right in the middle of an SRM. Now we're dangerously close to what I've criticized or picked on people in the past uh, who uh, brew, who formulate recipes with brewing software. Mm -hmm. It used to be in the homebrew shop and people would come in with a list of ingredients as long as your arm. You yeah. know, I, I need an ounce of this and <laughs> half an ounce of this yeah. and four ounces of that. And, you know, it's just like, uh, what software do you use? <laughs> right. So uh, this is why I didn't like doing metric because it's like, oh, I need 2.63 uh, kilograms and it, it just felt didn't feel like round numbers and and <laughs> with pounds it feels like you know round numbers but yeah I hate doing that I I personally like you know nine pounds one pound half pound right I mean you you know you're the the malt bill so far is is pretty 
uh, is pretty basic. You know, we haven't gone completely wacky with this thing. No. <laughs> so I'm not saying that we've gone completely over the edge. But you can see how that you could you could head down that road. The other thing, too, is if you with this software that I'm using, you can actually enter in the percentages instead of the actual amounts. Mm. And when you do so, I could have 80 percent, you know, uh, and then 8 percent and then 2 percent. And that's going to give you the really weird, yeah. you know, 4.2 <laughs> ounces and, and 1.6 that yeah, your homebrew shop owners uh, measuring that stuff out is a is a big fan. Of the... Yes, <laughs> yeah. So you know, uh, I would I would I'm just look you know changing some things here. So it's like yeah, you're basically looking at two percent chocolate malt, ten percent caramel malt, it's caramel sixty malt to be specific, and then about ninety percent Maris Otter. Oh okay, oh, right. all right. So that's kind of where we are, and it, and it kind of sticks us right in the middle of our ABV range, our OG range, our FG range, and our uh, color range, our SRM range. So it's kind of like right there. Well, is it is it time to talk about hops yet? I think it is. So I I with this style, I think I want if I were to to do it, I would mm-hmm. want to go sort of more old style basic. Uh, you know, a bittering charge at the beginning of the boil. Yep. 60 minute boil. Yep. Uh, and, you know, it matters less what hops you use at that point. Although, you know, some people say it does matter. Right. Uh, and then, like, a couple of uh, maybe Whirlpool additions. Mm hmm. Um, you know, so you get a nice charge of bitterness, clean, crisp bitterness. Yeah. Uh, and then maybe, you know, with a couple of old favorites at the end, you know, maybe a Centennial or a Cascade, mm-hmm. um, you know, just to, you know, get the, uh, the Centennial is going to be in my, on my palate, the Centennial is going to be more of the kind of piney kind of thing. The Cascade is probably maybe more grapefruity. Right. Um, but a blend of those two together, you know, like post boil, uh, to me sounds delicious. I agree with you. So which one do you want to use for bittering, Centennial or Cascade? I mean, Cascade's got a lower uh, alpha acid, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I here for bittering lately, I've just used like Czech Sots. Yeah. You know, just because it's so, it seems to be so clean to me. Mm-hmm. You know, for a 10-gallon batch, maybe you do, uh, you know, an ounce or maybe an ounce and a half, you know, uh, just as a bittering. Well, but for this, for this beer, I might start with just a, just an ounce. Yeah. And it's, that's exactly what I put in. And it's one ounce. Minutes. Yeah. One ounce at 60 minutes. I did cascade, but we can do, you want to do uh check? No, cascade's fine. I mean, okay. we'll stick with the American theme on this one. Now that only brings us, by the way, we're doing a five and a half gallon batch. This is what my system is. Okay. So anyone out there is taking notes. Um, and one ounce of Cascade, which is set at around 5.5 alpha, 5.5 percent alpha acid, brings us to around 14 IBUs, and we want to be between 25 and 40 IBUs. So we're not balanced yet. Now, obviously, we could hit our low end right now, right? We could we could say, all right, if we add two ounces of Cascade, maybe that brings us to like the low, you know, or the mid twenties as far as IBU is concerned. And then hope that anything we add in the whirlpool isn't going to, you know, send us over 40 IBUs. Yeah. Right. And this is where the, it gets a little bit, you know, kind of trial and error. And especially with your system, like my system, and I'm not, I think with you, you add your hops directly to the boil, right? Right. And you're at a sea level essentially. No. Yeah. Well, what is it? Two or three thousand feet. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm at uh, like fifty five hundred feet. <laughs> um, so for me, my boiling temperature up here is one hundred and like ninety seven, one hundred ninety eight degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. And so that means I don't get as much. Uh, my my wort isn't as hot, and so I don't I isomerize as many alpha acids as you do down there. I don't know how crazy you know different it is. But this software does account for that uh, altitude. What's the altitude of Prairie Grove, Arkansas? Oh, oh, it's only eleven hundred and sixty-five feet. 
Yeah, and mine's <laughs> five thousand. Yeah, I don't know nothing about geography. But your but your water <laughs> boils at two hundred and twelve degrees Fahrenheit. Yes. Um, like more like two hundred eight or two hundred nine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. At least so. Yeah. So my IBU calculator is going to be a little bit different again. We're taking notes here. Right. Um. So if I were to add in two ounces of cascade at the beginning of the boil, that brings us to twenty eight IBUs which already puts us in range via the low range and that, but that gives us our IBUs. And so we don't have to worry. The other yeah. thing too, about my system and again, different from yours is you add hops directly to the boil where I add them to a hop spider just so I don't clog up my lines. Um, and so I believe in my, you know, I don't have any, it's only anecdotal. I would say that I have to add maybe a little bit more hops to get the same sort of IBUs that you would have to. Okay. Right. So, well, you we go could... with experience. I mean, that's that's one thing about, you know, uh, when you're formulating recipes, it helps to brew again and again and again, because you kind of know you get a feeling of what your system and your setup is going to is going to bring you. Exactly. And that's why I think software is so helpful, especially when you have your system dialed in, is it allows you to just plug start to plug in things and it's all going to be calculated based on what your system already provides you know and even my altitude it, it, it adds that calculation in there which i don't know if you want to do those sort of calculations on a piece of paper but <laughs> it just feels like a lot a lot of computing yeah. power yeah hey now that we're talking about ingredients and building recipes from scratch it's a great time to talk about the build your own beer page at highgravitybrew.com our friends and sponsors desiree and dave from high gravity in tulsa were in the computer world before opening their homebrew shop, and you can tell it by looking at their website. It's not Craftworks Computer World, even though they are the operators with their pocket calculators. And, and there are really cool features on HighGravityBrew.com to make your ingredient and equipment shopping fun and easy, like the Build Your Own Beer page, like I talked about before, where you can see the contents of a fully stocked homebrew shop all on one page, from base malts to specialty malts to hops, adjuncts, flavorings, all kinds of yeast, it's all there. And when you add items to your shopping cart, your total is calculated at the bottom of the window so you can track your spending in real time and see that as it updates at all times. It's super cool. And while you're on HighGravityBrew.com, check out the awesome Warthog electric controllers and turnkey electric systems. Use the code EBC75BB. You can save 75 bucks off your Warthog purchase. Check it all out at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. So when you think about, and, and, and I know you talked to Michael Tonsmeyer about this on the recipe development episodes of um, when to add hops, and I think he had mentioned he adds a lot of his hops in the Whirlpool. It's kind of the new right. the new thing where you either, it's like, it's like they're really just as bittering, which is however long you want to boil, whether it's 60 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, and then you have whirlpool editions, right? And then dry hop. Right. So those, you know, no one's doing 20 minute editions anymore. I mean, I shouldn't say that they are ob ob obviously doing those editions, but well, the, you know, the bell, the bell's two hearted clone that I've, I've been using that I think is, you know, it's on the AHA website and it's on Bell's site too. Uh, yeah. They call for a 30 minute edition and a 15, no, a 45 minute edition and a 30 minute edition. So. Right. But, you know, that's a recipe that's worked for many years. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, it works for reasons. I don't see them to retooling <laughs> no, no. Uh, to spend more money on hops probably. Probably, uh, <laughs> yeah. To get the bitterness up there. Yeah. Um, so what do you think about it? How much, uh, how much do you think of each hop for the Whirlpool? Um, so when I do Whirlpool, you know, I, I make a lot of New England IPAs and I and the the highest I've gone is six ounces mm. it, during the Whirlpool editions. And I and I kind of feel like any more than that. It, and it's you know, it's a little overkill. So that to me is like my I look at that as my peak. And for this beer, you know, there you are going to have bitterness when you do the Whirlpool. It's it's going to happen. It just there's no calculator that's going to tell you what that IBU is going to be, right? So you kind of have to, I kind of feel like this is a, a random guess. And, but, and, I would, and at the same yeah. time, you don't want your, you don't want, I, I wouldn't want this beer to be juicy. No. You no, know, so no. six ounces at the, at the Whirlpool is like a, an enormous amount. 
Yeah, you're getting into hazy IPA territory there. Is yeah, and it's going to be about. it's going to be too bitter. I yeah. think. Yeah. Um. So you know, an ounce to start with of each. You know, well, let's Centennial start. Centennial and Cascade. Well, all right. Let me let me see this. <laughs> I I like I like the idea of Centennial being. Uh, I do like the idea of having both of them. Okay, so let's do. Um, and with this, it's it would be the aroma hop stand edition, and then we we can put a time on this. So we're just gonna call it uh, we're gonna call it zero, because we're not gonna do a whirlpool, right? We're not gonna sit there and let it steep for fifteen minutes, unless you I'm, think I, you, I might. You that's, might. That's generally what I do is I shut off the heat, and you know set a timer. So I'm essentially at boiling temperature. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but, but before I st- – and then – but then sometimes I'd chill down to like, you know, 180, 180. Or 160 mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, that would, I think, give you more of a juicy yeah. character that you may not be after. So if we were to add one ounce of Centennial at 10% alpha acid for 15 minutes, that brings us to 34 IBUs. So we're kind of now inching more towards the – um the high side of the IBU range, which is not a bad thing. Now, if we set that time at fi- at zero, so instead of 15 minutes, that brings us back down to 28. Oh. So it, it almost – it doesn't add any IBUs. I'd, I'd is... want at least like 10 minutes. Right. Th- I th- I th- 10, 10 minutes just <laughs> randomly. <laughs> yep. That's the thing too is – is so <laughs> – What's funny is 10 minutes gives brings you back to 28 IPUs <laughs> in this software. So it's like, you know, and it's uh, not true. That's that oh, I'm sorry. You know what? That's dumb. I that's my fault. <laughs> it brings us to 32 IBUs, so directly in the middle. Now that's 1 ounce of Centennial. If we add another ounce of Cascade, which is half the amount of uh IBUs in this case, or sorry, half the amount of alpha acids. Uh let's put that in at 10 minutes as well. And let's do that as a Roma hop stand. And that brings us to 34 IBUs. I think that's pretty decent. Okay. And it gives us, um, you know, a good ratio on, uh, you know, so your your target, um, you know, bitterness to gravity ratio, uh, you know, it should be between 0.5 and 0.7. And, uh, you, you know, so we're at 0.66. So we're definitely more on the, um, we're, we're still in the balanced Amber side. You know, if we were to go all the way up to maybe one, then you were start, we're talking about, you know, a red IPA at that point. Mm. Um, so I, I think this is a perfectly good place to start. And, now, is, and again, make it, see how would, it tastes. Yeah. Would you, would you dry hop this? No, I wouldn't personally. Yeah. I, I tend to agree with you. Again, yeah. again, it's not an IPA. Um, well, I'll say this: I think a dry, I think a dry hop would cloud the beer up, mm. and I, I want this to be clear. Okay, you know, I think it should be clear. And then yeast, would, I think that's a simple one. Just... Well, so I again, this is where I, I, um, there's two different fermentation profiles, and you can choose which one to go with. Uh, there's you're in you know, most people or most recipes that I saw, they call for a clean fermentation, which is, you know, California ale yeast, the Chico strain. That would be Imperial flagship. Mm-hmm. Uh, y yeast, USO five, USO five, 1056 from Y yeast, WLP 001. You know, that's, you could do that simple, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you wanted a more <laughs> fruitier fermentation, you know, you're using, Cascade and Centennial, which tend to be, you know, more of like, you know, citrusy kind of. If you want it to like sort of accentuate that pininess or that citrusy n- note, uh, you could go for uh, a German alt strain like a uh, Imperial's Kaiser. There's Y uh, 1007 WLP 036. Um, but personally, I feel like I kind of want to keep it more on the the clean dry side, mm-hmm. you know, um, and ferment that at, you know, whatever temperature USO five or Imperial flagship wants to ferment at maybe 67 degrees Fahrenheit, 19 C, whatever. Um, that seems right for me. Yeah. Now, if I add that in, let's just use Imperial. Why not? Right. Um, <laughs> for no reason. Yeah, for no reason at all. <laughs> Imperial, uh, 
flagship. Okay, we'll add that in, which is nice. We have all that information in the system. Now that does change a few things in the in the software. Um, that brought us down a little bit in um, that. I think that brought us down a little bit in AVV, at just a point or two, and brought us up a little bit in uh, Final Gravity. So we're at, we're finishing at ten thirteen. We're starting at ten fifty two with a ABV of five point one an SRM of 13, like kind of right in the middle there. Um, so we're definitely in the amber territory for IBUs. We're sitting at 34 and we're, we're good to go. Yeah. Now the last bit, which is not, we don't have to go into detail about this is water chemistry. Right now. How are, how is, how has that been going with you? Well, I've, I haven't brewed since I got my results from Ward labs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm planning a, a to rebrew, uh, a Bell's Two-Hearted clone with, using Maris Otter as the base malt, mm. uh, but that's going to be like next week. So I so I haven't uh, actually had any experience other than just putting my data in as a water profile. Yeah, um, but it looks pretty easy. I mean, it looks like yeah. you just put in your data uh, of what your water is, and then choose the style that you're shooting for, and it will tell you what to add. Right. And that's as, pretty we much, as we talked about it in the water episode. Yep. And what I would, you know, with this, there, there are kind of two ways you can go, I think, with, um, with, with this water profile. I think the easiest one and the one that I would definitely go with is balanced. So if you're doing, uh, if you're using any sort of software or using a spreadsheet like brewing water, you're going, there's, they literally have a profile for amber balanced beer. Um, so what I would do is set the target profile um, at you could do amber or strong balanced and which is what is it would in the software that I'm using. So I'm just going to add that cause it makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. Now what that gives us is, um, basically we're adding some calcium chloride and we're adding some sulfates at about 150 parts per million. Um, so I'm starting with my, uh, reverse osmosis water. And if I just hit the little button that like tells me exactly what to add, we're kind of adding, Roughly one and a half grams of uh, like from from gypsum, calcium chloride, Epsom salt, regular salt, you know, kind of across the board. So, you know, because we're starting at already a balanced uh, water profile of, of reverse osmosis water, um, we can we're basically just upping the uh, the mineral profile a little bit. And that's it. Hmm. You know, so. So it sounds, uh, it sounds like we got a recipe. We do have a recipe. Yeah. <laughs> We absolutely do have a recipe. And that wasn't so hard. No. And and you know, I think um it wasn't it's not hard. It's actually I think it's fun. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like playing a little game. Yeah. And I like again, I, I like that it's simple. I like that we're using ingredients like Cascade and Centennial, probably hops that you know and have tasted a million times before. Mm -hmm. You know, Maris Otter, I think, is a good choice for the base malt because we're sort of um, you know, we can get complex with our malt bills. I don't personally like to do that. I like to keep things, you know, max three different grains because I want to taste every one of them. You know, you start adding a little this, a little that, you know, yeah, and you then get, you start you to get muddy. You get a little muddy. Yeah. Um, so I like that we're we're sticking with like a nice um medium crystal malt to kind of give us that caramel flavor. And then we're adding a little bit of chocolate malt, which to me gives that coffee note, but only like 2%. So just a little bit on the top and, you know, just to kind of help us a, a little bit out with color and a little bit of dryness and maybe, maybe just a hint of coffee, which I, th I think is a good, I think it's a good move. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. And so you're actually going to brew this beer? I have everything. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure I had definitely have Maris we Otter. We didn't we didn't talk about this beforehand, but oh yeah, you gotta have it. Gotta have stuff in stock. Somebody should probably somebody <laughs> should probably brew the beer. <laughs> well, excellent. This has been great. Mm -hmm. This is you know when I started talking thinking about doing this collaborate, you know I got on the th line with you and Chris Colby, and we talk, started talking about how we're going to do this series. This is how I envisioned it. It winding up, you know, you talk about all the various parts, and then at the end of it, you start talking about how you put things together and actually do it. Yeah, yeah. And and what's nice about the series too is, uh, and I and I have gone back and listened to them all twice now. Um, 
it's really good to have that base knowledge of all the ingredients because then when sh- once you start researching any style that you want to brew and you start to see other recipes, all of a sudden those ingredients are going to make sense to you. You're like, oh, right, they mentioned that. And that's got this flavor yeah. and, you know, and I should really only be using 10% because otherwise you get this, you know, off flavor or whatever. So I, I think having that base knowledge is useful even when you're researching, especially styles you've never done before. Or maybe you've never even had before. Yeah. Well, Matt, I appreciate uh, the information and your time again. And it's always fun. No, oh, thanks for having me again. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Matt. Check out BrewCabin.com and the BrewCabin YouTube channel for excellent homebrewing content. And if you've got a pool or a hot tub or something like that and need advice and education, check out SwimUniversity.com along with the Swim University YouTube channel. Very popular on the internets. Matt says he's got the ingredients for this uh, amber ale, but he's injured his foot, which set him back a bit from brewing. So he's looking to brew sometime next week. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing an update on how we did, how it turns out. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our uh, mumble friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us for our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. So until next time, until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.